Hey, I'd like to kick this session off. We've got, uh, we've got an hour and we've got four speakers, so we've got 15 minutes each, so I'd like to try and allow a bit of time for questions if we can. Um, the theme of the conference um, is about sharing outcomes, and social research is uh, a really important and growing part of citizen science and citizen science research. So um, uh, today we've got four speakers. We have Sharon Pittman, Tina Phillips, Erin Roger and Nina James. And we're going to kick off uh, with Sharon Pittman. But please, um, before we kick off, um, there's a couple of competitions um, at the conference and on the conference app you can find the competitions. There is a sustainability competition and you have to upload a photograph of, your, uh, of demonstrating how you have handled uh, being sustainable at this conference and you need to do that by 2 o'clock today if you want to enter the competition to allow the judges to uh, give it a time to um, uh, judge them. Um, and also there's a student um, presentation competition and our last speaker, Nina James, is a, is a PhD student so she's eligible for that uh, student competition. So you can get onto the app and go to the link and, and um, vote for Nina after the, uh, after the presentations. But without further ado, uh, Sharon Pittman from Inspiring South Australia. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks very much, everybody, and it's great to be here. And I'm absolutely amazed at the um, fascinating and the high quality uh, you know, stories that we've heard so far. So what I want to do is very quickly um, check out science, if a little clumsily, coming from the Latin word scientia, meaning knowledge, and has been variously described. So my best effort is on the slide here. So it's a systematic way of thinking. It refers to both the process of discovery and knowledge. It's useful, generally. It's based on collaboration and consensus. Um, it's intellectual and practical. It's creative, it's ongoing, and it happens all over the world. So, not surprisingly, it's often argued that science literacy, or even civic science literacy, is a necessity in the 21st century. Not only for business and employment and economic things, but for an informed citizen citizenry who are able to understand and inform public policy issues. So what is science literacy then? So it, it's a variety of things. It's a general understanding of the nature of science, how, how scientific evidence is generated, its ability to think critically, interpret, understand the role of uncertainty. Um, it's about ways of thinking and the knowledge needed to make sense of public issues um, for personal decision making, for participation and for productivity. It's inherently relevant to the social context in which we operate. And the OECD framework defines it as about engaging with science-related issues with the ideas of science as a reflective citizen. So a scientifically literate person then should be able to understand the science relevant to contemporary issues and make informed decisions about these issues. Now, it matters for very many reasons, other than skilling the workforce and being economically productive, which is obviously important. But these other points are important to understand how we, as a species, fit in to the Earth system. Um, we've got a, a lot of big issues and a lot of local issues confronting us now. Our population is expanding rapidly. Our footprint is expanding rapidly. Um, the pressure on planetary resources and so every day we all make many decisions that affect not only our own lives but the world around us. And this is why it matters. So the job of science, um, well, this, this might not be a complete list, but to better understand the world, to develop the knowledge and skills to live and work more effectively and productively and sustainably, to move us from an opinion-based views to evidence-based help us make informed decisions and obviously to enrich our lives in very many ways. And while a scientifically literate community brings all manner of benefits both to society and the individual, the potential consequences of not having a scientifically literate community include ill-informed decision making, ill-informed planning, ill-informed leadership and the inability to effectively and positively impact public policy. So let's just take one example of why science literacy is important, the expansion of cities. So in 1850, 
2% of the world's population lived in cities, but by 2050 it is expected to be close to 75%. That's about 6 or 7 billion people. Now we have approximately 37 megacities with about t over 10 million people in each, and the UN predicts by 2030 we'll have about 41. An estimated 60% of the built environment needed to accommodate the Earth's population, urban population, by 2050 is not yet built. That's scary. So the rapid expansion of cities is a hell of a risky business. And a major UK report has identified the three major risks to the world's cities as climate hazards, resource scarcities, and damage to vital ecosystems. Now, I'm, I'm into environmental science, so I'm going to focus a little bit here on ecosystems, the third identified risk. And if you listen to the financial industry, you might be forgiven for thinking an ecosystem is a secret universe in which money moves in mysterious ways. Um, the term is now used by so many people in relation to so many things. However, real, actual ecosystems provide the life support for our planet, as you all will know. That's the functional unit of the physical environment that serves a community of organisms and the flows and exchanges of matter and energy between them. Cities are urban ecosystems, and, and they're more complex than that, but it's the biological components of city ecosystems that provide the critical essential services that we need and that make them livable and functional. Ecosystems are highly valuable, and scientists working out of the ANU have been are global leaders in valuing nature and ecosystems, whether you like the idea or not, it's, it's happening. And the conservative estimate for total, total global ecosystem services in 2011 was 125 trillion US dollars per year. That's nearly double the GDP of that year. And each year that value is declining due to land use changes and manage, land management changes. But what such figures do, you know, whether we like them or not, is highlight the magnitude of the importance of the ecoservices provided by ecosystems and raise, raise the importance of that value. So the general economic value can be summarised as, as these things. And without these ecosystems, the cost of living for humans on this planet would be astronomical, if not impossible. Without humans understanding this, we have a problem. So how does all this relate to the expansion of cities? Well, directly and urgently. Directly because, as you know, many cities are built by clearing most, if not all, vegetation, filling in the wetlands and marshes, reconfiguring the waterways, building concrete, impervious structures on top, um, and completely interfering with natural processes. And so, so the ecosy ecosystems are, are damaged and the consequence is they struggle to provide ecosystem services. And urgently, because given their populations and footprints, cities must be at the forefront of managing these big risks, the challenges of climate change, resource scarcities and ecosystem damage. And despite some great cities and some improvements, most cities lack vegetation, healthy water systems, and have damaged ecosystems. Most suffer from urban heat island effects and have not really factored in changing climates in a practical way. Which raises the question of how much have we thought about the science, the knowledge which should underpin how we treat our land and water and how we create cities. We've already made thousands and millions of decisions that could have been made better if we'd known better, not just as leaders, but as citizens. And I'm clearly suggesting that lack of science literacy has led to some bad decisions. So, how scientifically literate are we in Australia? Well, in 2013, the Australian Academy of Science conducted a science literacy, literacy assessment through OSPOL, similar to one they conducted in 2010. We don't have time to go through the results, but for example, um, most Australians had a basic grasp of scientific information, but there were still very large numbers who answered very important questions incorrectly. The 2013 figures were down on 2010. Um, men were more accurate than women, but that's another whole story. Uh, high education yields better uh, um, results than low. That's probably fairly obvious.
The knowledge among young people dropped more than among other groups, but everyone tended to think that they acknowledged that science education was very important. Now, my own research has looked at ecological literacy in particular, more specific than science literacy. And this involves the capacity to know and understand places as ecological systems, including how they function and connect with other systems. And that's both place-based knowledge plus knowledge and understanding of the interconnectedness of local and global environments, including the interface with human society. Understanding the world as a network, a systems view. And we looked at many socio-demographic factors, and once again, the agenda issue is another conversation, but education obviously made this huge impact, especially we found science-based education in both school and in further education made a very large impact. Um, there was age differences, um, that was the category that had the highest level, but uh, the lowest was the 18 to 24s, by the way, interesting. Where you grew up made a huge difference, so people who grew up in, in small communities were much more ecologically literate, probably through being more in touch with their communities and more in touch with their um, environments. Um, and the field of employment, so there was lots of things that did make a difference in terms of those. And it supports the claim that both, both education and science-based education in particular, plus familiar and long-term relationships with place are very high importance. This is obviously much more complex than this, and I'm just skimming over. We also looked at a range of psychographics and found that outdoor and nature-based activities and lifestyles, along with formal education and research activity, all have very strong correlations with levels, levels of ecological literacy. Also, how much nature was valued and enjoyed, and how much time is spent in nature all contribute. So the thing is that scientific literacy, including ecological literacy, in this context includes knowledge of the world we are working in and with. The place, its systems, its resources, what sustains them, how they interconnect. And the key question of how to manage this balancing act inherent within urbanisation won't go away. And the issues are more complex than ever, with increasing demand for infrastructure and product um, while protecting and sustaining ecosystems and their services is no mean feat. And all this requires the systems thinking of science literacy. And sadly, it's also argued that no major industrialisation nation in the world has a sufficient number of scientifically literate adults. Now, much research has looked at the ways people learn and become informed including informal, such as relational learning, observation, being in nature, environmental volunteering, childhood experiences. An enormous contribution is made through people connecting with nature, learning about natural systems, learning about the individual elements of these systems, such as species and their habitats and their food webs, people teaching each other and taking children into these places to learn and to learn to love places. And several studies have documented and discussed the important role of citizen science in contributing to individual education and learning outcomes, as well as to community level outcomes. And I have some of that research if anyone is interested. So, citizen science, well done, and so many examples of that we've had over the last couple of days, can make a critical contribution to improving the science literacy of communities, such as through generating a basic appreciation of the nature of how scientific evidence is generated and an ability to think critically about information and data. Citizen science demonstrates that science is a systematic way of thinking and building knowledge, is collaborative, is creative. Citizen science puts us in touch with many aspects of science in an engaging, time-friendly and user-friendly ways. And I haven't even really touched on the social or economic value of citizen science. So given that it's the job of science to get us to know and understand the world we live in and beyond, and it's the job of science to move us from opinion-based to evidence-based understanding of the world, the quality of our decisions now and in the future are critical. 
And the role of citizen science can have in this, I think, is not just nice or of added value. The role is actually really, really important because we don't have many other mechanisms to do this. So, the future is something we're all involved in creating. And not only does it need to be socially just and inclusive, but it needs to be ecologically viable. And for this to happen, one of the most critical things we need is evidence-based knowledge and understanding of the world and its inhabitants, and we need to be scientifically literate. Thank you.